Welcome back to the Cold War. Last time we discussed the division of Europe and the Truman Doctrine. Today's focus is on some of the key events in the Cold War, each important due to the underlying possibility each of them brought of nuclear war. One thing we should note is that each side keenly understood the consequences of using nuclear weapons and that it meant mutually assured destruction. Not only would your enemy be obliterated, but so would you. JFK said that if there was a World War III, that the next war would be fought with sticks and stones. The place that the Cold War heats up is not surprisingly Berlin. Stalin desperately wanted to control West Berlin, but could not risk nuclear war by taking it by force. Not only would have it been a power play for Stalin, but part of the reason he wants to control West Berlin was that it was a successful capitalist economy. For Stalin, whose propaganda says that everything in the West is wrong, this is a problem. People suffering under communist regimes in Eastern Europe only had to visit West Berlin to see that that was not the case. So in 1948, Stalin decides to block highways and canal access to uh, Berlin in order to quote, repair them. His hope was that when the US and the democratic West could not supply them, he would welcome them with open arms. See the bear hug. However, after 300 days of daily supplies being airlifted in, Stalin was forced to back down and reopen the highways and canals. It was the first success of the Truman Doctrine and the policy of containment. It also led to the formation of NATO, previously mentioned in Lecture 1. Stalin died in 1953 and Nikita Khrushchev became the premier of the Soviet Union. When many of Stalin's crimes against humanity came to light after his death, Khrushchev tried to paint himself as the kinder, gentler dictator. And while he lessened some censorship of the arts, media, and undid some of Stalin's harsher rules, he was still very much a dictator. In 1955, he created the Warsaw Pact, a counterpart to NATO, and further control of the Eastern European countries' militaries. Likewise, it was Khrushchev who started the space race by launching Sputnik, a series of artificial satellites. They were also the first country to put man in space. The U.S. would recreate NASA in response and in 1969 beat the Soviets with the moon landing. It was this type of competition that would be characteristic of the Cold War. Each side wanted to show itself to be the best so that other countries would join their side or our side. It was a war of ideologies with deadly consequences. In 1956, some of what Kennan predicted seemed like it might be coming true in Hungary. When thousands of protesters took to the streets in popular demonstrations, the leader of Hungary instituted a series of reforms. He ended the one-party system and dropped Hungary's membership in the Warsaw Pact. The system was imploding from within, just like Kennan said it would. However, Khrushchev tried to get Nagy to undo the reforms. When Nagy didn't comply, the Soviets invaded Hungary and suppressed the movement. 25,000 Hungarians and Nagy died as a result. Likewise, when thousands of people started leaving the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe for the West, the Soviets responded to the East German government's plea for help. Together, they constructed the Berlin Wall in 1961 to force people to enter and exit West Berlin through military checkpoints, effectively closing this border. Things really heated up, not in Berlin, but halfway around the globe on the island 30 miles off the coast of Florida. In 1959, Fidel Castro overthrew Figlio Batista in a communist revolution. For the first time, communism was a reality in the Western Hemisphere. President Eisenhower, under the guise of containment, had the CIA try to assassinate him with no success. Dissatisfied, he turned to the military for an alternative solution. The result was the Bay of Pigs plan. In 1960, JFK became president and inherited the plan. Assured by Cuban refugees that it was if the U.S. invaded, the Cuban people would join the fight, JFK gives the okay. The plan fails miserably for the U.S. For Castro, it validates his rhetoric that the U.S. was out to get him. He turns to the Soviets for help. Khrushchev happily obliges and gives Cuba nuclear weapons. Khrushchev insisted that they be kept a secret. 
Castro did not want to. Under international laws, it was perfectly legal for the USSR to give nuclear weapons to Cuba. Nevertheless, the plan remained a secret until in October of 1962, a US spy plane took aerial photographs of the missile sites. Convinced by the evidence, US Ambassador Adelaide Stevens confronts the Soviet Ambassador de Bruyneen at the United Nations. When de Bruyneen lies, the evidence is presented. The US and the Soviet Union enter negotiations after the OAS gives the US permission to quarantine Cuba. The secrecy ultimately backfired on the Soviets and much of the rest of the world supported the US wanting them removed. At the end of a very tense 13 days, Kennedy and Khrushchev thankfully agree to end the blockade and quarantine for their removal, thus ending for a time the threat of nuclear war. Khrushchev was forced from office in 1964 and Leonid Brezhnev became the next leader. He undoes many of Khrushchev's reforms and tightens his grip on Eastern Europe. This leads to many people seeking political asylum in the West. One dissident was the writer, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote about the gulag system from Stalin's time. Years of oppression and economic woes creates much opposition. The system that promised equal distribution of wealth didn't live up to its goals. The system was imploding from within. In the 1960s, when Khrushchev was still in power, there was the breakup in relations between the world's largest communist countries, China and the Soviet Union. This would open the door for President Nixon to restore relations with China. The effect of the Sino-Soviet split was felt in Eastern Europe as other communist countries attempted to assert more autonomy and distance themselves from Soviet domination. For example, the Albanians moved to protection by China and the Romanians voting differently than the Soviet Union at the United Nations. You see, throughout the Cold War, the US's allies and the Soviet's allies always voted the same as the US and the Soviets respectively. There was little the Soviets could do about that. But in 1968, when a rerun of Hungary essentially takes place in Czechoslovakia, opposition to Soviet dominance is once again crushed by Brezhnev. Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, there were many unsuccessful attempts in Eastern Europe for freedom and democracy. Poland was no exception. In the 1970s, marches on Communist Party headquarters would end in violence and destruction. In the early 1980s, a young electrician from the Lenin shipyard in Gdansk would change methods to nonviolent protest. His movement for, quote, free trade unions would eventually bring down the communist regime in Poland. Next time, we will take a look at the solidarity movement from within.